Welcome to this talk about uh, two-way bindings, where we'll compare Angular, Ember, and Knockout.js. Um, my name is uh, Marius Gunnarsson. Uh, I work for a, as a front-end consultant for a company in Norway called Cyber. And if you want to get in touch with me, you should probably contact me through Twitter. So two-way bindings. Raise your hand if you've worked with two-way bindings before. Yeah, that's quite a lot of you, which is impressive when you consider that two-way bindings the word didn't exist six years ago. This is the Google search trends for two-way bindings. And so in 2007, Microsoft is who developed this stuff. And they developed it for Civil Light. And it's, so it's only in the last two years or so that we have access to it in, in, in front end with JavaScript. And in the JavaScript world, two-way binding is used to connect HTML and JavaScript together. So this means that when the user interacts with the DOM and something changes there, the change is automatically reflected into the JavaScript model. And if you do something to the JavaScript model, the change is automatically reflected back into the DOM. So the way this is usually coded is with a declarative binding, like this one. Here we say that we want to bind this input element to the message over here. And so when the user starts typing something here, you notice that the um, the text, uh, uh, the DOM automatically updates with the correct text, but so does the JavaScript. And if you save what the JavaScript object should be like, then the DOM automatically changes back. Now, quickly before we move on, this this is all I'm going to say, like the introduction stuff. This is not a tutorial or introduction to two-way bindings or to any of the two-way binding libraries that we're going to look at. There's plenty of tutorials and good documentations for all three of them online. So if you're interested in any of them, you should go online and have a look at it. That also means I'm going to skip some details. So if you are familiar with them, you might notice that I skipped over some slightly important details. But that's because I'm interested in how they're working, not how to use them. And so the ones we're going to look at today are AngularJS, EmberJS, and Knockout. <laughs> Excellent. OK, then we'll start with Knockout. Um, I think we're going to start with the syntax. So this is the syntax for Knockout. It's pretty similar to what we saw earlier. We say that we want to data bind the text of this span to the message. And so here you can see the result of that. We can do the similar thing with an input field. So we say that we want to bind the value of this input to the same message. And so when you change the value of the input field, the span automatically changes. Um, now, for this to work, we also need some JavaScript. And so this is how you do it in Knockout. You create an observable variable. And this actually returns a function. And you can call this function with uh, one argument or zero arguments. If you call it with one argument, then you're going to set the value. And you notice that the preview up in the right corner automatically changed instantly. And you can call it with no arguments just to get the current value. So now we have, with Knockout, we have the ability to read and write the message from the HTML, and we have the possibility to read and write it from JavaScript. We can do a similar thing with Ember. Ember doesn't use HTML, it uses handlebars instead, which means that it simplifies things quite a bit when you just want to output a message. All you have to do is wrap it in two curly braces. Uh, now to input an element, you need to use the Ember text field, and then you have to specify the value binding. Slightly more text, but you get the same result, if I can spell correctly. Um, now on the JavaScript side, things are slightly different. We need to create an Ember object. And then anything inside the Ember object can be bound to the HTML. And so if you want to set the message from JavaScript, we use the set method on that email object. And again, you saw that the preview up here instantly updated. And we can get the current value using the get method. So uh, knockout and ember, slightly different in syntax, but they have exactly the same functionality. So then we have AngularJS. Angular kind of takes the best of both worlds. So it uses the curly braces from ember, but then it uses the normal input field from, Angular, uh, from uh, knockout. And so we have, again, the same functionality. Uh, on the JavaScript side, Angular uses completely normal objects. And it uses an object called the scope. And any property on the scope can be bound to the HTML. 
when you want to set it, all you do is set it like any other normal JavaScript object. But notice that nothing happened up here in the preview, because after this, you need to call the apply function. That's when something happens. Now, if you program with, knockout, uh, with uh, Angular before, then you probably don't always call the apply function, because Angular is pretty clever about calling it for you. But it still needs to be done. So what's going on with this apply function? Well, uh, when you just set the message, uh, Angular has no idea of exactly what you've done. You could have done anything to the scope. So the way it does this is that it loops through every property in the scope and sees if it has changed. And if it has changed, that's when it updates the DOM. And then it saves the new value so that it has something to compare against next time the scope changes. Uh, this, can has, this is what's called dirty checking. Uh, so yeah, you check which uh, elements on the scope object which are dirty. This can have some kind of strange side effects. So here we have uh, a text. I might have, oops. When I enter some text, you see that uh, the preview on top changes instantly. Now we're going to add 5,000 elements to, this, to a list on the scope. And yep, there we go. They're all down here. Now this should have changed anything for text. But if I now type something, notice how much slower it is. So just because you added a lot of stuff to the scope, Angular is suddenly slower at rendering your application and working through it. That's because when you change the text field, Angular doesn't know that. He has to check every one of the 5,000 elements to see if any of those have changed. And it has to do that for every time you change anything. Now, Ember doesn't have this problem. In Ember, we can, whoops, we can do some text. And then we can add 5,000 items. And <laughs> yes, there we go. Awesome. Yep, and still things are working perfectly. That's because Ember keeps track of dependencies. So it knows that when you change the text, that's what happened. It doesn't need to check any of the 5,000 elements. And it's the same story for Knockout, actually. So um, yep, entering some text. Adding 5,000 items. There we go. And just as quick as it was before. So to summarize, Ember and Knockout, they use observable properties, while Angular uses dirty checking. And that comes with some unfortunate side effects. Now, as you quite noticed, Ember is a bit slower at rendering the 5,000 items than the other two. And so I ran the experiment several times to find out like, what the performance was for different number of items. And as you can see, Ember is quite a lot slower than Angular. So we can't just say that dirty checking is slow. It, it's slow in some situations, but it's really fast at rendering 5,000 items, because you don't have to set up all the dependencies and observables that Ember and Knockout have to do. Let's also go back to the Knockout example we had. And notice that the code I ran here is slightly different from the other ones. Here I'm creating a temporary array and pushing into it, and then updating the list afterwards. If we use the same code as the other ones did, looping through 5,000 items and pushing them, and we execute this, things are going to get a bit slower. And so what's happening now is that you're pushing 5,000 uh, 5, times, and so the list property is going to update 5,000 times. And yes, any time now. <laughs> yep, taking time, taking time. Yeah, OK, yeah, you can probably see that it's quite slow. Yes, there we go. <laughs> um, let's just refresh it, because I don't know what happened now. Uh, yes, so Knockout actually crashed when I did that. Oh, there we go. Yes, stop it and refresh. So what happened here is that when we push the 5,000 items, uh, Noka goes ahead and renders this to the output right away. And it manipulates the DOM for every one of those pushes. And that's very, very slow. Now, Ember is quite clever about this. And so when you push the items, it sets a timeout, and then it waits. So it says, OK, yeah, you push an item. I'm going to wait four milliseconds and see what else you're going to do. So when you keep pushing items, it just says, OK, I'll wait. I'll deal with this later. And then four milliseconds later, that's when it figures out what it needs to render. And so it only has to do one rendering. Now, 
Angular is the same thing as we saw because it uses the apply function. So nothing actually happens until the apply method is called. That's when it renders stuff. In other words, Angular and Ember uses asynchronous rendering, while Knockout uses synchronous rendering. And that can be quite slow in some situations. Now let's have a look at computer properties. This is what makes the two bindings really, really cool. And we're going to look at an example where we convert Celsius temperatures to Fahrenheit temperatures. So we can do that with this function, or this formula, which in JavaScript looks like this. Now, if we do this in JavaScript, then we're going to get um, value f, which is like the Fahrenheit value of the current Celsius value. But if we change Celsius, nothing's going to change for the Fahrenheit. We need to recompute it again. But with computer properties, that's going to happen automatically. So whenever the Celsius changes, the Fahrenheit automatically changes. And this makes it really cool when you want to make uh, front-end applications. Things instantly change, and you can do computed functions on those. Now, Angular uses the scope, and we just define a function on it, which looks quite similar to what we had just now, the basic code. But remember, Angular uses dirty checking. So it doesn't know that the function f depends on, fun on the scope, f c. So what's going to happen is that it's going to recompute this function whenever anything in the scope changes. And that's kind of a waste of time. If you have a big, uh, big scope and lots of objects, then this function is going to run anytime anything changes. That's not useful at all. Ember, this is the Ember example. And so far, it looks pretty much the same. We just use the Ember syntax to get the current C value instead of the, um, instead of the Angular version. But you need to add a dot property at the end. And this says that this function depends on the value C. So now Ember knows that it only needs to run this function when C changes. Uh, and so you don't have the problem that Angular had. But we can create an example where Ember kind of struggles. So this is a very simple uh, example where if A is true, then this one is going to return B. And if A is false, it's going to return C. And we specified at the bottom that it depends on A, B, and C. And so when any of these properties change, then it's going to recompute itself. But now we have the problem that if A is true and C changes, then it's still going to recompute itself. But it's going to return the same value as last time, because neither A or B, which is what's in the execution path, uh, has changed. So it, we, can, we can say what the dependencies are on, but the dependencies are, dependencies are all fixed. And it's going to depend on those for the continuation of the program. So then we have knockout. This is the knockout example. All we have to do here is say that we want the C value. And we use the, uh, the getter version of calling the C observable without any parameters. And if you take the example we had with Ember, then knockout doesn't struggle with this. Knockout knows that. Uh, and every, every time you run the computed function, it sees which ones you're going to, which have been used. So it, it runs through this code and it says, okay, you got the value of A, and I'm going to note that down that I need to depend on A. And then I return B, and I'm going to note that I, that I depend on B. So next time, it's going to listen for A and B changes, and it doesn't care about C. And if A changes, then it's going to depend on A and C. And so we have that. AngularJS doesn't really have computer properties, uh, but Ember and Knockout does. And, and Knockout is the only one that has de dynamic dependencies, where the dependencies can change during runtime. Oops. OK, so to summarize this, we looked at syntax today, and the syntax are quite different between the different uh, languages. Um, we looked at dirty checking versus observable properties. And we found that dirty checking isn't such a good idea. Observable properties are a lot more advanced, a lot better to use. Then we looked at synchronous versus asynchronous code. And we saw with the knockout example, which crashed, that synchronous code isn't a good idea. Asynchronous is a lot better. And then we compared the computer properties in the different ones. And we looked a bit about performance. And so many of you are probably wondering, OK, so which one is the fastest? Which one is the slowest? Well, we saw that. Ember is very slow at rendering lists. We saw that Angular is slow when a model grows. And we saw that Knockout is slow when you push many items. So none of them are actually fast, and none of them are actually slow. They all have strengths and weaknesses. And well, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.
the conclusion is we're all screwed. Yes. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes. 11 o'clock, we're taking a break um, until 11.15, where we're going to have Jan uh, Krutish come in and, I hope I said that right, JavaScript patterns for contemporary dance music, which sounds funky. Um, do you guys, if you have any questions, we could yeah, throw we, some we up here. Question round? Yeah. If anyone have questions? No. Yes, there's a question over there. Yeah, uh, I can give you a mic. Hold up. What do you think the uh, the new kind of uh, what are they called uh, like property syntax? Do you think that'll make a difference to any of the libraries? The property syntax. So you've been able to define uh, a property that has a getter and a setter. And yes. Okay. So yeah, I wanted to discuss that, but I skipped it. And yeah, so the problem with that is that Internet Explorer eight doesn't support it. So if you want to make a library that supports Internet Explorer eight, you can't use it. So unfortunately, now. Uh, well, while we're on that, uh, in the next version of Java, uh, JavaScript, ES6, there's going to be observable properties built into the language, which is going to solve many of these problems just right away. So, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Yeah. The question was, do you look at two-way binding in Polymer, or have uh, you looked at it? No, I haven't had time to do that. I had to look at two binding in these three, and that's more than enough for now. I'm probably going to look at others as well and see how they compare. Yep. But yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, I think uh, in Polymer or in the web components, uh, especially, we need to have some way of two-way binding. Using just finding it at the object and attaching event listeners to it is not a good idea. Yep. More questions? Oh. Were your examples based on production experience or just experiments that you did? Uh, for the so talk? Some of them are based on production experience, yes. So, uh, but you, but it, all of these examples I showed where things fail, there are ways to work around it. And so, like for example, the, the knockout, you saw that it was a different way to do it. With Ember, the list is slow, you can create your own uh, for each loops and just look at what you're interested in. and. Yeah, so all of them have ways to work around these issues. So maybe you could use all three frameworks at the same time. No, I'm just I kidding. I have no idea. I'm just kidding. Do we have one more question? Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have any experience uh, with synchronization data models between client side and server side? to have the same data models? Uh, I'm no. really interested in if uh, uh, we, can have, we, can, we can share the same data models on the server and the client side to manage, uh, manage it only at one place. Yeah that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't actually looked at anything like that, or not something similar to this. There's something called PouchDB, which is probably the closest thing you can get, which is a database you have on the client and on the server, and you synchronize them. That's probably the closest thing you can get to that. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. See you guys at 11:15.